goes on. Um, we'll talk now on the Brexit process. Yes, with maybe a few on-colour jokes as we go along. Actually, there's been a slight change to the title of my talk, which was going to be called uh, The Brexit Process, and it's now called The Brexit Process So Far. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm, I'd like to start with a few words about the background to Brexit, because it is important, affecting the whole thing, before we joined the common market, and how the European Union developed over the next 40 years, then I'll discuss at more length the core of the Brexit process, deciding whether to leave the European Union and trying to implement the vote to leave, each taking about three years. And finally, I'll say a little bit about future problems and what happens next. Uh, now, before we join the common market, the main purpose of the coal and steel uh, community that the European uh, <coughs> countries started up in the early 1950s was essentially to stop another war, prevent another war between France and Germany. And France wanted to Europeanize Germany before they Germanized Europe. That's the plan. But Britain was not willing to join a supranational organization. That's always been a big problem for us. And in 1957, as you will know, I'm sorry, you will know quite a lot of this, but I'm an old teacher and sometimes reminding people what happened in the distant past is just about worth it. Um, in 1957, the Treaty of Rome established the European Economic Community, as they called it then, and the six original um, member states all had similar standards of living except for southern Italy. And that's quite important in view of later developments. Uh, the preamble to the Treaty of Rome mentioned as a goal ever closer union. Uh, but for many years, we didn't take much notice. We regarded the so-called common market uh, as a commercial project. But in fact, it has always been, as it clearly still remains, a political project. Uh, in the early post-war years, France and West Germany and Italy all had faster growth than we did in this country, largely due to a one-off switch of much of their labor force, about 20%, I think, in each case, from agriculture into industry, which had a positive effect on their economic growth rate. The same thing, of course, has happened to us 100 years earlier, uh, in the middle of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now, Harold Macmillan, uh, in the early 1960s, hoped that joining the common market would increase Britain's growth, growth rate. We have to remember economics was never his strong subject. Uh, but in 1963, the, he published a book called The Middle Way, which was Rank Socialism, published in 1938. It shows you where he was coming from in this debate. Uh, in 1963, de Gaulle vetoed our entry on the grounds uh, that the English were too different from the continent uh, in our history, politics, legal background, and trade patterns. And he was right. I was going to vote to stay in in the 75 referendum, but when I actually got to... to in, into the polling booth, I thought uh, I had what is unusual for an accountant, an emotional spasm. I thought, I can't, I can't do this, we're too different, it's never going to work. So I was going to. Then in 1973, about 10 years later, we had, had two or three applications in between. The UK, together with Ireland and Denmark, did join the common market, which of course caused an upheaval in our trading arrangements with the Commonwealth. And in the 1975 referendum, you will know this, all of you, we voted two to one to stay in. It wasn't close. It was absolutely overwhelming. A two to one is, in, a, in a binary choice is a huge margin. Now, over the next 40 years, of course, there were several major developments. I'm going to be very selective. The Schengen Agreement in 1985 allowed passport-free travel between countries. And the Treaty of Maastricht, a few years later, um, led to the single currency. And in 1999, 11 countries uh, out of the 15 that were then member states joined the euro. Um, when Sweden voted against joining the euro, uh, the EU rather typically didn't wonder what's wrong with the euro. They said, what's wrong with Sweden? But what was wrong with the euro? First of all, the eurozone wasn't a natural optimal currency area. 
Without political union, it was unlikely to last. Everyone said that. And it admitted too many countries that weren't suitable. And in fact, they set out five criteria for membership before they started. And only one of the 11 countries met all five criteria. Guess which country it was, tiny Luxembourg. All the rest <laughs> failed to qualify. But Chairman Tony Blair, who was masterminding the thing in 1998, got <coughs> in anyway. I think it's fair to say that neither of these two key policies have been great successes. The UK decided not to join either of them and was allowed opt-outs from both. The Euro, I haven't got five hours, so I won't go into all the problems, <laughs> but it has caused a lot of problems, uh, including very high unemployment across southern Europe. Uh, and mass immigration into the Schengen area from the south has led several member states to reintroduce border controls. And the next big thing that happened in 2004 was that eight former communist countries, plus Cyprus and Malta, uh, joined the European Union uh, as it had become. They keep changing the name. We think the United States of Europe is next, but it's probably quite a long way away. Their combined GDPs equaled only a quarter of the UK's GDP. That suggests how much our exit might affect the rump EU, as I call it, uh, quite apart from any political impact. And at first, the EU aimed for a single set of standards for similar countries. That was how it started, which made a lot of sense. Some people argued for deeper integration between a hard core of a few countries, while others wanted more member states and a looser relationship. Ted Heath was in the first group. Margaret Thatcher was in the second group. Uh, but with major differences now between large and small member states, north and south, and west and east, hardly anyone is now satisfied with the EU's one-size-fits-all approach. Former Foreign Secretary David Owen used to argue for a two-tier Europe to take account of the nine member states out of 28 that aren't in the Eurozone. But really, the EU has shown very little interest in doing anything about that. And over the years, and again you will all know this I think, British public opinion has gradually been shifting against UK membership. And by 2013, that's the end of the 40 year period I've just been talking about, um, the EU was very different from what we'd been told 40 years earlier. For example, its share of world GDP, this is all the current 28 member states, so it's a fair comparison, um, its share of world GDP has fallen from 38% to 27%, and its share of world trade has more than halved. Uh, and the demographics are dreadful looking forward. And in 10 or 15 years, once we're outside the EU, it will perhaps represent 25, 30% of our trade instead of just under 50%, which it does now. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about deciding whether to leave the EU. And that was kicked off, of course, by David Cameron, who I think history books will regard as a hero, despite all the problems. Um, his Bloomberg speech in January 2013, he first talked about how unhappy we'd always been with ever closer union. And he urged fundamental, far-reaching EU reform. He slipped up a bit there because the European Union doesn't really do reform. And in order to come to UKIP, and if you're leader of the Conservative Party, you have to worry about these things. The Conservatives said if they won the next general election, there'd be an in-out referendum on EU membership. He didn't expect to win. He was in coalition with the Lib Dems, if you remember at the time. They did win the election narrowly and, to be fair, kept their promise. But having said there'd be a referendum before December 2017, Cameron decided to hold it 18 months earlier. What's more, and worse, he wouldn't allow civil servants to think about what might happen if we voted to leave, which he didn't expect. That was grossly irresponsible. You don't have to be Einstein to realize that in a two-horse race, it's only prudent to assume that even the outsider might have some chance, however slim, of winning. Between the election of May 2015 and a referendum in December 2017, there could have been two and a half years of planning, contingency planning. Instead, 
At the time of the actual referendum in June 16, 2016, there'd been none at all. By the end of the two-year Article 50 process, after a 20, December 2017 referendum, we could have had at least four and a half years of planning for Brexit. Well, now Cameron tried to win some softening of EU rules, especially on free movement of people, which was the kind of fashionable problem of the time, it, rather in the way that the Irish backstop has become fashionable over the last year or two. It is a fashion. <laughs> um, like him, the EU thought Remain would win, so there were no significant concessions on offer. Cameron asked for very little and got less. That was the, <laughs> that was the negotiation of which Jacob Rees-Mogg said, pretty thin gruel, which is a nice way of summing it up. Nearly all the establishment were Remainers, including every living former Prime Minister and former Deputy Prime Minister, most of the Cabinet, and through gritted teeth, Eurosceptic Jeremy Corbyn. Also, most civil servants, the media, and 500 MPs. I'm going to say a little bit about the campaign, but you again know most of this. The Remain campaign and the official Vote Leave campaign each spent £7 million. And on top of that, the government itself spent £9.3 million of taxpayers' money on pro-Remain propaganda. This far from level playing field exacerbated people's mounting distrust of the governing elites. Harold Wilson had stayed above the fray in 1975, but everyone knew the 2016 result would be much closer. So David Cameron chose to lead the Remain campaign himself. Like Wilson, he allowed members of his cabinet to argue on either side. Uh, a tradition, Theresa May, seems to be uh, carrying on in government. <laughs> the Remain campaign focused on the economic drawbacks of leaving, but said very little about the positive benefits as they saw it from remaining. Their campaign relied on experts, many of whose past forecasts had been a long way out. Uh, for example, 364, this is going back a bit, 364 leading economists had claimed Geoffrey Howe's 1981 budget uh, would end in disaster. Uh, they were mistaken. Uh, it was a huge success. When Mrs. Thatcher was challenged in the House of Commons to name two economists who supported her, she named Alan Walters and Patrick Minford. Later, someone said, thank goodness they didn't ask you for three names. <laughs> I told Patrick that joke not long ago, assuming he must be familiar with it, and he wasn't, or he'd forgotten it. So he was pleased with that story, which shows him up in rather a good light. And of course, he's been one of the leading lights on the economic front in this latest uh, campaign. Uh, he kind of slipped up by saying he didn't mind if British manufacturing was wiped out, which didn't go down too well with the CBI. <laughs> Project Fear, as it was called, exaggerated so blatantly that its doom-laden projections ending, ended up being counterproductive. Most of the public simply didn't believe them. And again, you didn't have to be an economist to realize when you were being conned. It was absolute rubbish. It was embarrassing watching what they churned out. Remainer said a vote to believe would cause an immediate increase in unemployment of at least 500,000 people. Now, there's a bit of a surprise coming, so hang on. They were completely wrong. <laughs> in fact, unemployment went down. It reminds me of Ralph Harris, the first general director of the Institute of Economic Affairs. He defined a forecast as a pretense of knowing what would have happened if what did happen hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> in my view, the PricewaterhouseCooper forecast, though fallible, like all forecasts, was the best. They predicted that if we stayed in the EU in 15 years' time, which is a sensible sort of horizon to be looking at, our real GDP per head would be 29% higher than now. Whereas if we left the EU without a deal on WTO terms, it would be 25% higher. The difference is only about a quarter percent a year. In other words, the economic pros and cons, according to this forecast, roughly balance out. And that's my position. I don't think the economics matters in this debate. I myself would have voted for Brexit even if I believed in the long run we'd be a little worse off, uh, though in fact I don't think that. 
I repeat, PricewaterhouseCooper thought even leaving without a deal after 15 years, we'd be 25% off, better off than now. Brexit itself, I've hinted this already, is a political decision, a preference for being an independent, democratic, sovereign state rather than a province of an ever closer union, uh, which we British certainly don't want, governed by unelected and unsackable foreign politicians. And democracy, of course, is a peaceful way to allow voters to throw the rascals out from time to time. To avoid that, the European Union was deliberately designed as an anti-democratic organization. And one unexpected consequence may have been that the Eurozone's policy, in effect, promoted populism right across the continent of Europe. That's where it's coming from. After 2009, the Labour government allowed immigrants from the two new member states, Romania and Bulgaria, to come to the UK straight away. Most other EU member states allowed a pause of seven years before letting them in. The government expected only about 13,000 people, but in the event there were hundreds of thousands. And the Conservatives promised to limit total immigration to the UK, then over 300,000 a year, to tens of thousands in future. Nobody thought that remotely credible. But the key point wasn't just the absolute level of immigration. Many people felt both parties over several years simply hadn't listened, but had just ignored their views. The official Vote Leave campaign stressed democracy and sovereignty, while the well-financed official rival Leave.eu emphasised immigration. Made it tough for the Remainers because the Leavers had two different lines of argument, and it was tough to cover them all. Um, it made it difficult. Many voters cared about those aspects of EU membership far more than the economic pros and cons. Take back control was a powerful slogan with strong emotional appeal. The Remain campaign didn't appeal to the emotions at all. In effect, they were saying, better the devil you know, but it was a devil that we knew, namely the EU. Yes. <laughs> the campaign's political leaders, David Cameron, David Cameron and George Osborne for Remain, and Michael Gove and Boris Johnson uh, for leave, all agreed that a vote to leave would mean leaving both the single market and the customs union. And Andrew Neil, very sensibly, has record of all four of them saying exactly that on television, and he repeats it quite frequently. <laughs> Some Remainer MPs have since, including Ken Clark, by the way, have since tried to deny this. And nearly everyone agreed, by the way, that the quality of the debate was extremely poor and disappointing on both sides. And I shudder to think what the quality might be in a second referendum if that were to come about. <coughs> well, now let me talk about trying to implement the vote to leave. Uh, the overall UK result of the 2016 referendum uh, was that 48% overall voted to remain and 52% voted to leave. With Scotland, Northern Ireland and London all voting on balance to remain. But in England and Wales outside London, the margin in favour of leaving was much wider, with 55% voting to leave and 45% to remain. Uh, and in March 2017, Parliament voted by a large majority to trigger Article 50, with its two-year period and a default option at the end. Uh, then, the subsequent general election endorsed the, Bre the, the Be Brexit mandate, and both main parties' manifestos promised to respect the result of the referendum. It's worth mentioning that, though it's well known, because it kind of affects what might happen or might not happen in future when we think about the incentives for MPs who've broken their promises. From the EU's viewpoint, Article 50 has been very successful. It deliberately aimed written by an English civil servant, to make leaving extremely difficult. Instead of thinking of Brexit as a neighbour quitting a joint project, the EU chose to treat the UK almost like a defeated enemy. Still, the British government itself has evidently made the most awful mess of implementing Brexit. Um, 
I could ask for a vote, but I think we'd find there wasn't. <laughs> I think we'd find there wasn't a dissent. No, <laughs> You're a troublemaker. <laughs> everyone in the country, everyone in Europe, uh, can agree on that. An early mistake was to accept the EU's sequencing, pre sequencing preference. First, with only a minimum of goodwill, we could have sorted out the reciprocal treatment of EU residents, EU nationals in the UK, and UK nationals in Europe, even before triggering Article 50. We could have taken the moral high ground on that, but we didn't. Second, none of the parties want a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, though we couldn't make sensible progress on this before talking about future trading arrangements. Unfortunately, EU rules don't allow this uh, until after any withdrawal agreement has been ratified. So we were in trouble right away. Third, we clearly did need to sort out how much money the UK owed the EU. £39 billion, which I think is the amount they agreed, spread over 15 years, is £2.6 billion a year, only one-seventh of 1% 1 of GDP. In other words, peanuts. Even if it cost twice as much to leave the EU, I reckon it would be one of the best investments any British government has ever made. <laughs> The EU was accustomed to managing the entry of new member states, who each had to accept the entire Aki communautaire uh, as it stood. The Commission had never had to deal with any country, let alone a large one, seeking to withdraw from the EU. So in this area, there had never before been much need for it to be flexible. Now, before triggering Article 50, and for months afterwards, the government made virtually no preparation for a no-deal outcome. Indeed, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, even said he wasn't going to waste public money on it. This further undermined our already weak uh, negotiating position. And last week, Hammond had the nerve to claim it was physically impossible for the UK to leave on the 29th of March. If that were true, which it wasn't, uh, it would be largely his own fault. I reckon the Treasury has been heading down the same path as the Foreign Office. As explained in Yes, Prime Minister, the Foreign Office uses a four-stage strategy. One, nothing's going to happen. Two, something may happen, but we shouldn't do anything about it. Three, maybe we should do something, but there's nothing we can do. And fourth, maybe we could have done something, but it's too late now. <laughs> I owe that joke to Lynn, of course, and Jay, the writers of Yes, yes Prime Minister. And I find it now too near the bone to watch. I mean, it's a hilarious programme, but it, really, I can't watch it. The British side kept on repeating the EU mantra that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And Mrs May has recently repeated, recently repeated, that no deal would be better than a bad deal. She's been testing this argument by proposing something far worse than anyone could have imagined. <laughs> in some ways, her deal would be even worse than staying in the EU. And the Commons, as you know, defeated her full deal twice by huge majorities. And just yesterday, a version of it, the withdrawal agreement part of it, by a moderate majority of only 58. There was a time when the government losing by 58 would be a sensation. Now, it's really almost a triumph for this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Project Fear 2 says no deal would mean we crash out over a cliff edge and be a catastrophe. Such exaggerated language is unworthy, even of the BBC, which has clearly revealed its pro-Remain bias, and the Financial Times. It is a disgrace to the media to use terms like that over what, after all, is what everyone's view is a serious political choice. Again, I think no one believes them, except, as far as I can see, members of the government and members of the House of Commons. They are out of touch, not only with the public, but with reality. The public narrowly chose leave, not remain. And it was narrow. No one need deny that. But despite their election promises, MPs couldn't bring themselves to implement the wrong answer. No wonder so many people, including the Prime Minister, are now thoroughly fed up with them. And the one high spot in Mrs May's performance over the last many months, in my mind, was the speech she gave for, I think it was a Wednesday ten days ago, when she slagged off the MPs. 
I thought she was absolutely spot on, and I think a lot of people in the country did. But unfortunately, the MPs, with their very thin skins, were thoroughly upset and um, indignant. I don't think they realize how people view them and their performance, their disgraceful performance. If and when we do leave the EU, nearly everyone, including many leavers, expect some short-term problems. Hardly surprising after being in it for more than 40 years. But the long-term impact is much harder to predict. It is a long-term forecast, and it is difficult to predict. But I agree with Adam Smith. His view was there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. That's not complacency, but a reluctance to panic. And I think he's right. Most Remainers have been pessimistic about our prospects up outside the EU. In contrast, most Leavers are optimistic. Liz Truss said she didn't believe all this plague of locust stuff. And Joseph Schumpeter, a famous economist, said pessimistic views always seem to be more profound than optimistic ones. Mm. But since the Industrial Revolution, the optimists have been right and the pessimists have been wrong. Thanks to massive and unprecedented economic growth, the planet's population has increased more than tenfold since the 17th century. As has global average real income per head, life expectancy has more than doubled, and in the past 50 years, absolute poverty has fallen dramatically all over the world. But there are still people going around grumbling. Well, that's fine. We're human beings, and there will always be grumblers. But don't let them upset you. Things are getting better, and they've already got a lot better. Finally, I'd like to discuss four aspects, briefly, of course, of the uncertain future. The UK Constitution, restoring trust within the UK, future relations with Europe, and the end game. Three UK regions voted in 2016 on balance to remain in the EU, as I said, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and London. Either Northern Ireland or Scotland, or both, might choose to leave the United Kingdom. But not many people so far have suggested that London might do so. <laughs> Most people in Northern Ireland probably still prefer union with Great Britain to union with the South, but the margin is getting narrower. After Brexit, in a so-called border poll, both North and South might vote for a united Ireland, in which case Northern Ireland could leave the United Kingdom and join the EU straight away with no fuss, rather like East Germany did after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The UK government, I think, was quite right to allow Scotland to hold an independence refer referendum in 2014, in which 55% voted to remain in the UK. Spain's treatment of Catalonia is not an example to follow. If Spain, sorry, if Scotland, well, Spain too, I suppose, if Scotland were to hold another referendum after Brexit and next time votes to leave the UK, it might have to wait for years before being allowed to join the EU from outside. Mm -hmm. Usually, Parliament's main job is to protect the people against an oppressive government. But recently, a government with a tiny majority has been trying to defend the pro-Brexit majority against a pro-Remain parliament. And this clash of parliament versus the people, which might have been and perhaps ought to have been foreseen, could easily lead, it's already beginning to lead, to a constitutional crisis. And I'm afraid, on present form, one can't really expect our current lot of politicians to handle it very cleverly. Now, an important task after Brexit will be to restore trust and goodwill within the UK to reconcile Remainers and Leavers after one of the most contentious political questions in this country since the Civil War, and it won't be easy. Here are a few examples of policies that might help the process of reconciliation. One, Council HS2, a London-centric vanity project likely to cost £100 billion. Pounds. Two, Build HS3, an east-west high-speed rail link across the north of England. Three, Council Trident, another vanity project likely to cost £50 million. Pounds. Four, build more houses, even if some of them are on the green belt. These aren't original ideas. Others have suggested them. I think Jeremy Corbyn supports at least two of those. Uh, good for him. Uh, it's tough, and it won't be easy. But it's got to be done. I mean, living in a divided country for hundreds of years would be desperately, even tens of years, would be really worrying. 
after we've left the European Union, the UK will no longer be bound by the EU treaties. And we can then seek future trade arrangements with the EU covered in the no non-binding political declaration. For example, should it be like Norway or Switzerland or Canada or what? This is a post-Brexit question. But Brexit is really about politics, not trade. And I, I haven't followed the arguments, and I'm not going to. And I'm not really interested. I don't think it will make much difference one way or the other. Uh, over the next few years, though, British statesmen will have to try to restore good relations with our neighbours across the English Channel. And that won't be easy either. Just after my former <coughs> student, David Davis, became Brexit secretary, I reminded him of something I learned from Hayek. The Greek word katalassine, meaning to exchange, also means to turn from enemy into friend. I suggested to David it would be a great pity if by blocking sensible post-Brexit trading arrangements, the EU managed to turn Britain from friend into enemy. What a triumph that would be for an organization that only a few years ago won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> now the end game. I haven't got much to say about this except try to identify the options, which all the papers have been full of this morning. According to the law, we should really have left the EU on the 29th of March without a deal. That was the default position. But the EU thought they'd be blamed for that, and they're very nervous about being blamed. Also, of course, they would really prefer the UK to remain in the EU. Instead, if Mrs. May May's deal hadn't passed by then, as it, we now know it hasn't, they offered us a two-week de delay to the 12th of April. So that's the new default uh, date. Yesterday, as you know, Parliament rejected the withdrawal agreement for the third time. So what are the options now? I think there are six. One, revoke Article 50 and stay in the EU. But I believe even this Remainer Parliament would hardly dare go so blatantly against the referendum result. I might be wrong, but that's what I think. Parliament might agree something on in an indicative vote next week, though it hasn't so far. But why should the government or the EU take any notice? I'm a bit out of step with the papers, though, who seem to think that's awfully interesting and exciting. I don't think it matters. A long further extension to Article 50 would mean the UK taking part in the May European elections and, which people aren't emphasising, many, many months more uncertainty, of which we've already had far too much. Nobody wants either, neither us nor the EU. The EU has said it would only agree to a long extension for a reason, such as a second referendum or a general election, neither of which the government wants. The question in a second referendum probably would, be, would have to be the same as before, remain or leave. But if leave won again, as I believe it would, what happens then? The Conservatives don't want a general election with Mrs May in charge. They certainly don't want a snap election for that reason. But electing a new party leader would take time. And after the long drawn out Brexit shambles, many MPs might be nervous about facing the voters before 2022 mm -hmm. in the hope that some of them will either have forgotten or died out by them. <laughs> the only thing remaining is for the UK to leave the EU on the 12th of April without a deal. The thing to remember, it's not up to us, it's up to the EU. And, and it's not the EU collectively this time, it's each of the 27 member states. You've only got to have one say, I don't agree with any extension, and we're out. And Nigel Farage apparently is going around Brussels trying to bribe the Bulgarians. Or the <laughs> <laughs> That's the new legal default option. We could bring it about by not... Uh, agreeing to anything else that they might offer in terms of extension. And the EU could bring it about by not offering anything else. Thank you.